Well, good morning, church. I want to welcome everybody in the sanctuary and everybody in the sanctuary. Uh, this is a very special Sunday. We're, we're in a sermon series called Generations, and today all the generations are gathered together in one place. Uh, ordinarily, on a typical Sunday morning, we have separate programs for kids, and we've got another uh, service for middle school students, and we even have different worship services, one in a more classic tradition, one in a more modern tradition. But this Sunday, and the two Sundays that will follow, we're all going to be together here in the sanctuary, and this helps in a, a, a several, several reasons why this is helpful. Uh, number one, this gives a much-needed break to some of our volunteers who are gearing up for a new church year. Uh, number two, it gives us an opportunity to worship all together as one church family. And number three, it provides the ideal setting for our theme of the month, which is generations. And so before we read the scripture passage of the day, uh, I'd like to invite all of the, the next generation volunteers to stand to their feet. If you serve in children's ministry or student ministry, would you please stand so we can thank you for your work this year. Children's ministry volunteers, student ministry volunteers, please stand. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we want to honor our, uh, our other special guests, which are the children of our church who may not always be here with us in the sanctuary. So let me invite, if I could ask children and teenagers, if you would also stand, anybody high school age or below, if you're in the room, would you stand to your feet so we can welcome you this morning? Yeah. Glad you're here. Now let us all stand to our feet and read together one sentence of Scripture aloud, in unison, all together, this sentence from Psalm 79, verse 13. Here we go. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Now, if in just a moment I asked everybody under the age of 80 to sit down, if I did that, would there be anybody left standing? Let's find out. Would everybody 80 years old and older remain standing? And everybody under the age of 80, take your seats. Now, uh, senior saints, senior saints, remain standing. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you'd be so kind to read that scripture again over us this morning. I think we need to hear your voice, senior saints. So can we ask everybody 80 years old and older to read this again over us this morning, please? From? Thank you, you may be seated. This scripture passage really is a declaration we will declare the goodness of God from generation to generation. And I'd like to hear every generation make that same declaration that our senior saints just did. And so we're gonna do, we're gonna try a scripture reading wave. You know how in some sporting events, uh, sections will, they'll stand up and sit down in such a way that it looks like a wave is coming across the room. But we're gonna do it not by seating section, but by generation. So everybody over 80 has already read the scripture, but in a moment I'm going to ask everybody in their 60s and 70s to stand to their feet and to say, uh, from generation to generation, we will uh, recount your praise. And they'll sit down. And then everybody in their 40s and 50s will stand up. And they'll say, from generation to generation, we will recount your praise. And they'll sit down. And then everybody in their 20s and 30s will stand up. And they'll say, from generation to generation, we will recount your praise. And then lastly, everybody in the room who's under 20 years old, including the youngest, then you'll, you'll be the finale Kids, you will stand up and you will say that from generation to generation, we will recount your praise. And so we start, everybody in the 60s and 70s, please stand to your feet. From. from. Okay, have a seat. Next group, stand up. From. All right, have a seat. 20s and 30s, stand up. From. All right, have a seat, and then last but not least, the youngest generation, everybody under, 
under 20, stand up, ready, here we go. From generation to generation, we will have Okay, wow, good job, thank you everybody. Yeah. Let's pray uh, right now. God, we thank you for all the generations that are gathered in this room this morning. We pray a special blessing on the youngest generation that they would know your protection, your guidance, and your joy. Help them to start strong. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said. So today's message is looking at this idea of starting strong in life. And the goal of this message is for all of us to understand some of the challenges faced by the youngest generation and for all of us to own the task of passing faith on to this next generation, whatever it takes. Last Sunday, you heard read Psalm 71. Let me read it to you again, this section of Psalm 71. The psalmist writes, Since my youth, God, you have taught me, And to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. I love this passage. The psalmist says, even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, God. But his primary concern is not himself. Until I declare you, until I give the news about you and your greatness and your goodness and how sweet life is in you, till I declare all of that to the generation that's growing up right now in the world. And we do this partly because I believe God has hardwired us to be concerned about the following generation. It's like an instinct God has placed in us. My mother, to this day, if she's driving and I'm in the passenger seat and she's got to hit the brakes, what do you think she does? Whoosh! Her hand comes out. Mom is 90 years old. She's four foot ten. She's not 100 pounds. There's no way she's going to stop me from going through the windshield. But motherly instinct. Whoosh! We just instinctually want to protect the next generation. Um, I, I, I heard a, a terrible joke, but I think it kind of fits here for the, for the, for the point. This uh, older couple, they're 90 years old. They've been married 70 years, and they go to see a lawyer, and they tell the lawyer that they want a divorce. And the lawyer says, you, you are 90 years old. You've been married for 70 years. Why would you want a divorce now? And they said, well, we wanted to wait until all the kids had died. Okay, terrible joke, but it shows this instinct that we have to protect the next generation, to not harm the next generation, to not hurt them, to help them in whatever ways we can do. So how, how we care for the next generation, how we transfer faith to the next generation, that varies from generation to generation. Look at this famous foundational passage from Deuteronomy, uh, one of the most important lines in all the Bible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. And then it gives some methods some ways that these parents could impress these commandments on their children. Talk with them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down at nighttime and when you get up in the morning. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses. Write them on the door frames of your gates. In other words, do all kinds of things so that these commandments sink into your kids. Do everything you can so that your kids see these commandments every single day. And then one generation later, in the book of Joshua, uh, God does a new thing. God's always doing a new thing with new generations. God has allowed the, uh, the people of Israel to cross over the River Jordan and take the promised land. And they're anxious to get on with their life out of the wilderness into the promised land. But God tells them, wait. Before you go on with your lives, before you turn the next chapter, I want you to do something for the generations that are to follow. I want you to pull 12 stones out of the River Jordan and place them in a pile next to the river's edge. Anybody remember this story? 
Why did God tell them to, to stack the stones up? It says in Joshua chapter 4, God said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. God says, I want you to interrupt your own lives and think about how you're going to teach this story to your kids. Think about how you're going to transfer this faith of a faithful God to your children. And again, the methods may change. A few hundred years ago, the primary vehicle for passing faith on to children was something called the catechisms. A catechism is a question-answer uh, document that's designed to be memorized and recited, and uh, it taught the core doctrines of the faith. For example, there was the Heidelberg Catechism, these beautiful words, parents would ask their children, like question number one, which is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And children would respond with the answer that they had memorized, the family had memorized this together, and, they, and I'll ask you to respond to this question, what's your only comfort in life and in death? And you would say... And then we would go back and forth, question two, question three, question four. Now, catechisms went out of favor a long time ago. People said, well, well, that's just rote memorization. That's not the way kids learn today. And that, that's probably correct, although I see catechisms, catechisms making a comeback in our day. Now, in our Presbyterian tradition, the prized catechism is the Westminster Catechism of Faith. But I confess that one I really like is called the New City Catechism, which is a newer and shorter version of older and longer catechisms. It's kind of a synthesis of all the old historic creeds into one. Tim Keller and some others have been involved with this, and I'm working through it now with our daughter parts of it. I really like this one. And it, the, the, there's a link in your app notes for today's sermon, and you can just Google search New City Catechism, New City Catechism. Methods come and go. What matters is parents and grandparents having intentional conversations with our kids. In the Middle Ages, one of the primary ways faith got transferred was through the images on stained glass windows. Uh, in, a, in a largely illiterate culture, children would see the stories of the Bible in the pictures of the stained glass, and adults would tell the stories to their kids. Uh, and this is the way faith got transferred. I have a pastor friend who, who their, their church has the habit of calling children forward every Sunday for a little children's sermon. Maybe you've seen that. And he had all the kids up front, and he pointed to the big stained glass window in their church, and he said, kids, who, who can tell me who is that figure holding the two large stone tablets? And one little girl said, that's, that's Moses. And the pastor said, very, very good. How did you know that? And she said, uh, it says Moses right under his his name. A pastor had never noticed that before. <laughs> so stained glass windows weren't just for beauty, they were a teaching tool to help kids learn the stories of the Bible. When I was growing up, my church employed a state-of-the-art technology called the flannel graph. Anybody remember the flannel graph? It was a board of flannel and these little cut-out Bible figures made of flannel and due to some science that I don't understand, they, they stick together and the teacher would put up uh, Noah, and then, you know, but the ark would kind of fall off next to him, and, you know, it, it would hold up Jonah, but never the full whale, and, 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 and that's how I learned the stories of the Bible. Methods can and do change. Methods come and go. But what must never change is the burden, the passion to get it done. That must remain a constant for grandparents, for parents, and for the entire church of Jesus. Now, I'd like to dig a little deeper into some of the unique challenges of this youngest generation. And I'd like to bring in our new children's ministry director, Justin Tucker, 
Justin, you may know, is relocating here from Colorado, moving here for this job, but he's originally from Wayne, Michigan, just down the road. And Justin studied human development and family studies at Colorado State University, and he's worked with kids and families for 17 years. Unfortunately, Justin is not here today. He's in Colorado this weekend, uh, helping his family get ready for their big move across the country. So uh, this week, Pastor Soon Pak sat down with Justin, and uh, they had a little conversation about this youngest generation, and let's watch that conversation now. Well, thanks, Scott. Uh, glad to be here sitting with Justin Tucker. Uh, not live, but uh, early in the week, we got to sit down and chat a little bit. He's in Colorado, actually, right now, uh, packing up and getting ready to move back to Michigan. But like Scott shared, you spent about 17 years working with children and families. Uh, could you share a little bit more about your experience and background? Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say hi to everyone. And uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, uh, I'm excited to meet you and get to know you all a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, 17 years of experience. I've worked as a summer camp director. I've worked as a preschool teacher, a uh, center director for a child care center. Um, and in my previous church in Colorado, I was the elementary director, which I got to oversee the kindergarten through fifth grade group. And on most weekends, we'd see about um, 400 or so kids every weekend, which was great. Um, so yeah, I've had a lot of fun learning um, and getting to know uh, many different children and families. And I'm really excited to start um, my season here at Ward. That's great. That's great. So. A lot of time working with children and families. Could you share a little bit about how, in our culture today, how are some, what are some shifts you've seen um, yeah. throughout the years? Yeah, I really think um, like two things come to mind. I think um, the first word is busyness. Um, just as a family, um, like we're busy. We have lots of things to do. We're always going here, go there, join this, do this. You know, which kind of sometimes takes away from just like a family time or a family game night or maybe a family Bible study, um, you know. And then the, the second thing would be um, technology. Technology is a huge um, part of our culture. Um, but, you know, neither one of these things have to be bad. They don't have to be negative things. I think technology, one thing my family and I like to do is we like to use Right Now Media, watch it on our Apple TV. Um, but I, I just think that as parents, um, you know, we just need to... Um, bridge these healthy boundaries for our families for both of those items. Yeah, that's really good. Now, what are some things you've seen stay kind of constant working with children and families? Yeah, I think the, the thing that stayed constant are the simple things. So kids um, are still in need of love and affirmation and acceptance from their parents um, and also their parents giving them security and comfort. Um, that's That still hasn't changed. Um, also, something that's super important in children's lives is that of other adults speaking into their lives. Um, I'm sure you can think of, or maybe you guys can think of, um, I know I can think of other um, influencing um, voices in my life. So other adults who had made an influence on maybe my walk with God, um, a big decision in my life, or just overall just being there for me when I needed a, a a good insight. So I think that those are people like our coaches, our teachers, uh, our Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, you know, so that's still really important for kids' lives today. So let's turn our attention back to kind of Ward Church, and we believe and adopt to the Orange philosophy and curriculum here. Could you share a little bit more about that for people that are less familiar with what that is? Sure. Yeah, um, Orange philosophy is really, it's, it's a ministry-based um, partnering tool. Really to kind of start with the, the word orange, um, we grab the family and we say that they're red, that's the heart of the family. We'll grab the church and we call them yellow and that's the light of the church and we blend those two together and we call it orange. So the orange philosophy is really this partnering and this partnership between the church and family and I think especially as a children's ministry and a church, um, the orange philosophy is to um, help and teach parents, grandparents, how to be the spiritual leaders in their homes. Um, but all the while, while we are um, teaching these kids about the Bible, uh, we're teaching them about Jesus, we're teaching them what being a Christ follower looks like, um, even as they're three years old or in fourth grade, um, you know, so all of those things are together to be a partner and work together. That's great, that's great. Well, 
We're going to send it back to Scott, but I encourage every one of you, uh, as Justin comes back, please introduce yourself, get to know him and his family. Uh, but back to you, Scott, for now. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so we believe the primary place of faith formation for children is the home, and the church backs up the home. I think of this daunting task every time our church celebrates infant baptism and dedication, parents stand right up here and they promise that they will teach their children the scriptures, that they will pray for their children and with their children, and they promise that they will lead their children to know, love, and serve Jesus in a world that does not make that easy. If any parent is listening to the vows they're making in that day, their knees ought to be knocking. What a daunting task. But good news, parents, your church comes alongside you and helps you keep your vows. Uh, my wife Angie and I were just talking about that this week. We were thinking through all the adults who've invested in the lives of our kids. And we're so grateful for the children's ministry workers and the small group leaders and the leaders of other parts of our church that have allowed our kids to, to serve and use their gifts and for uh, regular church members who've engaged our kids in conversation in the hallways. And uh, <clears throat> it's critical um, to, to know, to, for us to know that our kids have got adults in the church that care about them. So as we get ready to head back to school, I want to encourage everybody, again, to establish the regular rhythm of every Sunday worship attendance. Consistency is really important. Cindy Ziamba used to tell families, uh, don't make the decision every Sunday about whether you're going to church or not. Make one decision at the front of the year, we're going to go every Sunday. Otherwise, you face 52 decisions in the year. Are we going to go or not going? You preload that. I'm going to get my kids to church where they can learn the stories of the Bible, where they can get to know adults in our church, where they can feel the love of the congregation. Uh, it's time to make those commitments now. We pre-decide that. Well, let's look at our theme verse of the day one more time. I'm going to ask you to read it aloud uh, just one more time be before we uh, move in another direction. Psalm 79, 13, together, please. From generation to Now, this passage probably means, as we've noted, that we're to recount praise to the generation that follows us, that it's a successive generations. But you could also read this verse that each generation will recount praise to the other generations, older to younger and younger to older, middle age to middle school. And so we're going to uh, try something we haven't done in a long time here, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, we're going to have a time of open testimonies. There's a microphone right here and another one down here. And I'm going to ask you if you've got something to say about the goodness of God. How has God been good to you? How has God's power and his grace affected you? What is something about our great God that you would want all the generations to know this morning? And ideally, we'll have uh, all ages, and we'll kind of go back and forth, microphone to microphone, as the generations recount the praise of God to each other. And then we're going to sing together, and it's going to be a generational worship experience. Uh, to prime the pump, we have asked some people to prepare their comments ahead of time. We're going to do this in just a few sentences, if you come forward. And um, in fact, those who prepared, you can go ahead and start to line up. And, if, and if, if God's calling you to say something about his goodness, to declare his goodness to the generations, you come and stand in the line, and, uh, and we'll have a time of sharing, and then we'll, we'll sing. Uh, God of grace, from generation to generation, we will recount your praise. We thank you for the generations that have come before us. We pray your blessing on the generations that will follow us, maybe long after we leave uh, this world. May every generation know your goodness and kindness and sing that praise to each other. Thank you that we are one church, one family. Receive now our worship as the family of God for your glory and for your pleasure. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen.